cases against Janet Reno. Three wrongfully accused police officers charged with manslaughter. Two wrongfully accused armed citizens, one male, one female, who had fired in self-defense and were charged with manslaughter. And uh, later, when she became attorney general, one wrongfully fired female FBI agent. And we won all six, which tells you the kind of case that woman took in the name of advancing her career in terms of political correctness. And yeah, I don't worry about being on TV with us, because you know what? When you speak the truth, it doesn't matter if you're being reported. So here, I don't worry about it terribly, but wherever you are, you are one election away from draconian justice. And never forget that. Make it one of your concerns when you're all at the voting booth. Did, this, did the change in the laws 11 years ago change everything? <coughs> no. There, in Swanee County, as near as I can find out, there has never been so-called stand your ground here. Now, Swanee County is encompassed by the Third Judicial Circuit. Last I knew, there had been, in 11 years, there had been three 776-032 here uh, in Dixie County and Columbia County. Uh, two of those, the defendant prevailed, and the third, the defendant did not, and went to trial. But basically, by and large, it was a good step. Uh, the whole series of laws is printed out there in the handouts that we've given you. And I hope you'll find them useful the next time, whether it's you know, the family barbecue is where it comes up or the radio talk show. There's so much BS out there. How many have heard somebody say, oh, it's my house, by golly, I can kill any stranger I find in my house. How many have heard somebody say that? No, it's terrifying. That's not what it says. Yeah, your home is your castle. It doesn't allow you to have an execution chamber. Okay. It still has to be, there still has to be some <coughs> serious articulable threat. The, um, a great many of the cases, you know, where Castle Doctrine is invoked, have been domestic disputes that escalate, and the battered wife kills the abusing husband in self-defense. Well, here's the deal. The husband, yeah, yeah. you cops in here, how many times have you uh, arrested the wife beater? Said, why do you do that woman? It's my right. It's my house. How many times do we hear? I love it. I love oh, it. Your home is your castle, dude. Guess what? She lives here too. <laughs> it's her castle too. <laughs> and you've won an award. New jewelry. It's, it's not real silver. But it'll go nicely on your wrist. Let me have the other one. Oh, it's too tight. That's okay. They're new. They'll lift it up. <laughs> if, if it happens between an invited guest and the homeowner, the invited guest was so long as he is welcome shares Castle Doctrine with the homeowner. I did one case in Southern Florida. The uh, defendant's 20-something uh, kid, uh, young and, <coughs> how shall I put this? Young and in love, let's say. A uh, very pretty girl has invited him to a party at her house. He takes this as a sign. Well, he gets there, comes right on to her, and he does not realize Pretty girl lives here with her very jealous boyfriend who owns the house, and things go downhill. And jealous boyfriend says, Kid, you are out of here. He and his buddies are escorting him out, and the escorting turns into pushing. As they get to the car, it turns into an assault. He closes the door, he's trying to get his car started to escape. Uh, he sees one of the guys, uh, this is up right outside the garage at home, <coughs> sees one of the guys pick up a baseball bat from the garage and start coming toward him. And while he's sitting here, boyfriend's fist comes through the closed side window of the pickup and was fixed. Now you, you picture somebody strong enough to shatter safety glass with a fist. That kid was legally in possession of a firearm. He came up and he fired the two shots that took the young man. That went to a stand your ground here. Judge said, well, he was leaving, but there's some question whether he might have left before. It's an issue for the jury. I'm going to let the jury. <coughs> then it went to the jury. He was acquitted. But we've had the discussion about the enormous cost of going to trial. Not just the legal fees, not just the legal costs. The whole lot of employers who don't want to employ a killer anymore, especially a killer whose name is on the paper. Homicide in this state has very high bonds. Many jurisdictions, there's no bond at all if the charge is murder. 
there is going to be a bond expected to be in the range of, uh, of probably a million, which is going to require 10% gone forever to the bond agency, $10,000 gone for good for them to risk the other 90000 It tends to bankrupt defendants. It tends to deplete family treasuries, if you will, and it wastes, terribly wastes, the thousands of dollars a day it takes to keep courthouses open in this state or anywhere else. That's what these things were developed. Finally, uh, what's probably become nationwide the classic true standard ground case, uh, West Des Moines, Iowa, 20, 2011. A uh, man named Jay Lewis is driving home from work. He's a clerk with the IRS. Licensed to carry a gun, has a little 380 pistol. Gets into a conflict with two guys who don't like his street car. They start coming at him, he draws the gun, tells them stay back, the two of them are on. Now, it's what, uh, th people have the misconception that you can never legally shoot an unarmed man. Uh, the, what the opponent requires is not a gun, not a knife, it's what's colloquially been called ability, the power to kill or to cripple. Most commonly, it will be a per se weapon, the gun, the knife, whatever. It can also be force of numbers, a much bigger, stronger man, male attacking female, uh, an able-bodied man attacking a handicapped person, even if the handicap is taking place in the course of the incident assault. In this case, it was disparity of force. He fired, shot and wounded one of them. They decided they didn't want to play anymore and fled. He gets arrested, he gets charged. 112 days in jail. All comes out in the newspaper, he's been arrested for shooting. The, uh, the apartment owners where he lives say, oh my goodness, anyone who, uh, who would shoot another human being is obviously too scary to live among us. Uh, quick, let's get the eviction notice on his door. Well, it's kind of hard to find the eviction notice on your door when you are where? In jail. In jail. So the 30 days pass, all his belongings are put out in the yard. Uh, his guns, at least, thank God, were seized by the Sheriff's Department and, and uh, held in safekeeping. Every single thing, his furniture, uh, he, was, he, he wrote novels on the side, the computers that had two of his novels in, all stolen, gone forever. By the time he was acquitted, he was utterly found. Why did that happen at all? Because J. Lewis, the defendant, was black, the two guys he, who assaulted him, one of whom he had to shoot, was white. Anybody in here think that might have played into it at all? We'd like to think racism is gone in this country. That's bullshit. That's the reality we have to face. This kind of legislation allows reality to come through. It will give a prosecutor who's under tremendous political pressure to prosecute this person because the, <coughs> the progressives of the world say he's an evil danger to all because he carries a gun. It gives him a face-saving way to say, look, you can't blame me. I washed my hands of this. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> okay, you can blame those legislators in Tallahassee, but this package of laws in the 776 series says, my fiduciary duty to the public not to waste their tax dollars on politically correct bullshit. I can't get a conviction. I will not charge. And by the way, I'd like you to vote for me in the next election. <laughs> And this is an excellent time. So open it to Q&A. Sir. Can I request you use the word uh, BS instead of the other one? I will. I would appreciate it. I will use the abbreviation. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Um, you know, so many people carry weapons now. And I know I've heard in the news when people are in like a store or some place uh, public and somebody's being robbed and you think, you know, you're, they're going to be and you have a weapon, what's the best way to handle it? I've heard both sides, you know, somebody wants to just If, if you think they're about to be murdered, we're all going to be realistic with our own skills of how well can I shoot this gun, particularly if my heart's pounding with adrenaline, if my hands are shaking like this. Can I make that shot without killing the victim, particularly if the guy with the knife is here and the person you're trying to save is here? Okay, this guy has a pretty good shot to take me out. You to shoot me in the heart would have to shoot the victim through his head that destroyed the village in order to save it, and you might want to either move the <coughs> or sit it up. 
as a general rule, unless someone is being murdered or is about to be murdered, the general rule is leave the gun in the holster. Uh, a lot of people think, well, that ain't macho, but the history of it is most armed robberies, all they want is the money and they want to get up. They're running high on their adrenaline too. The gun comes out and they decide they're full of whole machismo thing and the shooting starts like right here in a room with dozens of people in it. We probably caused more problems than we would have solved. So he, the court say each case has to be taken within the totality of the circumstances. And the same is true of us. We, we have to act to the standard by which we know we'll be judged. If we know we're going to be judged by within the totality of the circumstances, we have to take that totality into account. Um, I would have both, that, I call that a huge law number three. A huge law number one is to be able to predict when the attack on you is going to come and have a counter in place, whether you're being cross-examined in court or fighting <coughs> on the street or anything in between. And a huge law number two is anybody arrogant enough paying laws after himself is probably arrogant enough to know them arbitrarily, so you don't need to memorize my number. Two things when that mother of a 14-year-old came into the came to the house. Yeah. Why didn't they back off and not go and engage that person? Uh, they were yelling at him to stop. Yeah. What, what you got, we're, we're all mammals. <coughs> Mammalian imperative is something threatens the nest, where we parents have our cubs. Instinct absolutely impels us to go forward and deal with it. Um, it's, it's kind of like, sometimes it's kind of like a dog chasing, the, the good guy chasing the bad guy is kind of like a dog chasing a car. It's not sure what it's going to do with it when it catches it, but it's not going to help the chase. And I think that's a little bit of what happened there. The other thing was the family was still in, in the traumatic emotional throes of the, the man of the house having been robbed and terrorized in that driveway. And by the time the guy turned toward them, think about it, if they had turned to run, can you move faster than the other guy can move forward? It's going to depend on the circumstances. But usually they can move forward faster than we can back up. If we turn to run, we're turning our back on a guy who maybe now has a knife, but in a moment is going to draw his gun. And there are folks in here who can outrun me if I've got a knife. There ain't a whole lot of folks in here who can outrun a bullet. The other thing is, I don't know if here are any cases of barratry. Oh, barratry, barratry generally means either uh, attorneys uh, guaranteeing a result or uh, soliciting for a uh, so it's not just presenting a frivolous case to the court. No, that's BS. <laughs> Actually, the legal term for it, let me use the legal translation, that's unmeritorious. Unmeritorious is the legal term for the term you found objection. Thank you. But I don't know. Uh, unmeritorious cases arise in court all the time. And nobody pursues the vehicle against the attorney. Oh, you can. What you've all got to remember is what you or I would call complete, utter, rant BS. When it's uttered by an attorney, is dignified as plaintiff's theory of the case. And the custom of the courts is that it has to be treated with the same gravitas as the actual truth that your side is trying to get across. And I don't like it a darn bit better than you, but it's what we are stuck with. That, that's why when these things come up, we have to, we can't just stand up and say, ah, that's BS. We have got to deconstruct the other side's case brick by brick by brick till it's laying in the dust. I used the, the analogy before, the vampire with the stake. In self-defense, the criminal, the murderer shoots to kill. His intention is to deprive the other person of their life. In self-defense, we shoot to stop. We shoot to stop the, the horrible thing this guy is doing. <clears throat> to stop the next Adam Lancer before he can pull the trigger again at Sandy Hook. Once he drops his weapon, once he collapses, we can't stand over him and give him the coup de grace. We have got to, that's why we say we shoot to stop, not to kill. In court, against the unmeritorious case, against that case, you shoot to kill. It's not just a stake in the heart. I want a stake in the heart, a clove of garlic in the smoke, head chopped off, buried at a crossroads, and the rest of it burned to ashes. Because if you have not taken every single argument the other side has brought up and burned it to ashes in front of that jury, 
in their final close, remember, the accuser always gets to go last. The accused, plaintiff in civil case, prosecution in civil criminal. The accuser gets to go first and last. They'll try to say something to confuse the jury with until their final argument when it's too late for you to review it. That's why you want every single element you even think they might bring up dead in the water before the door closes the deliberation. <laughs> Okay, I want to thank all of you for coming. I hope you all have a quiet, dry, and non-windswept night. Uh, if I can answer questions for anybody on anything, I will be here. Two things that you might find of interest. I'll leave these up here if anyone would like to take them. Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. Uh, it's a support group for people who keep or carry firearms. Uh, initial, uh, uh, Training fee includes like eight or nine tra excellent training videos, uh, one textbook, which I kind of like because it's my textbook and I get rid of it. And uh, basically, if you are in trouble related to defensive use of a firearm, it's ten thousand dollars cash on the table to retain the attorney, uh, unless you have, you know, murdered your wife and uh, frozen the corpse and put the pieces through a wood chipper. Uh, we on the advisory board are going to sit down and authorize the rest of the legal fees to be paid. Uh, we'll give expert witness support, trial tactics support, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if anybody finds it of interest, I suggest you take it anyway, because even if you're not interested in joining, the handout itself is a pretty good uh, quick introduction, kind of like jury instructions on self-defense law. I'll also <coughs> leave some of my business cards up here if uh, I can be of help to anyone. I teach here in uh, Live Oak a couple of times a year. And yeah, Herman Gunter in the far back there is my host, and he would be the guy to talk to if you were interested in any of that. Okay, any questions or comments on anything before we go out into the wild storm? Yes? Uh, my Ford permit has got hologram on it. And I noticed the hologram has got different languages like Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, and all that, just Russian. I was wondering if you knew why they had that on there. That is on what? Oh, Georgia carry permit. Georgia carry permit. I have no idea. Uh, Georgia accepts the Florida permit, and that's my simple needs all I need to know. I, I can't answer that one, sir. Uh, one thing, by the way, one other resource for you. Uh, uh, your Florida permits are recognized by more than 30 other states. That reciprocity changes frequently. It's, <coughs> it's essentially the result of an agreement between the Attorney General of Florida and the Attorney General of that state. Administrations change, policies change, and when they change, when they no longer recognize Florida, they do not let you know. So here's the deal. Anytime you're going to cross the state line, the best resource is handgunlaw.us. Handgunlaw.us. So Gary Slider and his team there stay in touch literally monthly with every attorney general's office at the state level in the country. They're the first ones on top of any such changes. And literally a stroke of the pen. Now, how many here have ever been to Las Vegas for a vacation or a convention or something? Okay, for years, Floridians would carry their guns in Nevada because the Nevada recognized them. Nevada decided when Florida went to, for you guys, savings and economy savings, well, we'll go to five year permits instead of four. Their Attorney General arbitrarily said, no, nope, no, nope, we won't recognize anything longer than four. And unless you had followed that website or were involved in the Second Amendment site, <coughs> or something like that, you would not know that the next time you went to Las Vegas, you had just been declared a felon. Mm -hmm. And if you, were, if you were in a car crash, they found that gun on you wow. uh, while you were unconscious, you would end up being a felon, unable to vote, unable to own a firearm for the rest of your life. It's the very definition of arbitrary and capricious, but it's what we're studying. <coughs> Gunlaw.us will keep you up to date on that. And you people who are way more modern than me and do iPhones and Androids and all of that, uh, the best app I found for it is Legal Heat. Legal Heat. Legal Heat. How do you feel about the last portion of that? Legal Heat. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I was reading a story where somebody came in and he was threatening, like in a mall, and somebody had a concealed weapon and stopped it. Now, is that something, you know, because you know he's going to do it out in a mall? Yeah, once, once, they, once they start shooting, open season, drop. What I would suggest. If you are, it's going to be happening more. Nobody thought Pulse was going to happen. 
Uh, pulse that occurred in Arizona, <coughs> state of Florida, as you all know. How many have concealed carry permits in here? Okay, we can't set foot in a bar. Even if we're the designated driver who's not going to touch alcohol, it's a class four felony to do it. Oddly enough, we can sit in the restaurant side, drink off the liquor menu until we're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> the state of Arizona, if you have the concealed carry permit, you can carry a gun in the bar, there's just zero tolerance for alcohol on board for you. If the pulse shooter had gone into the same nightclub in Phoenix, how many of us think he would have lasted long enough to murder 49 people? How many think he would have got about halfway through his magazine before the first bullet started hitting him? If you think about it, the defensive firearm is a direct analog to a fire extinguisher. Okay. Neither, neither, each of them is a symbol of a public safety <coughs> profession, but neither makes you that professional, neither means you don't need fire service or police service. Each of them is the first responder tool that lets you, the person who's right there where it happens, instead of waiting four minutes. National average police response time nationally is 11 minutes for <coughs> a 911 call. That's a whole lot of stab thrusts. That's a whole lot of trigger points. If you there on the ground can extinguish it like, like the homeowner killing the blaze on the stove, and it's the difference between a slightly scorched ceiling and the entire house burns down and kills everyone inside. It's the exact same principle. I will now step off the soapbox. Just a quick comment about the reciprocity mask because <clears throat> I love handgunlaw.us and legally recommend it when I teach as well. However, if you go to the state of Florida, most of you know by now, if you have a license, it's the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. They've got a, a rather extensive resource on there about concealed carry in general and reciprocity in particular. Handgun law does lag a little behind because if you go to the list that the state of Florida posts and they do it literally by the day, then you would find out that we're back on with the data again. Thanks, Steve. So the state when we were back and forth with South Carolina, South Carolina was the last Southeast state for us to get reciprocity. It was listed on the Florida website before it was even known in South Carolina. So the people up there at Ag and Consumer Services are on our side. <coughs> Don't miss the opportunity to keep up. Thank you, Stephen. I particularly want to thank Ms. Susan for her comments. <coughs> Uh, she, they almost uh, called it because of rain. And heck, for a moment there, I was afraid that she was going. Once I was started talking, she was going to call it because of BS. <laughs> <laughs> we have the library open for you. Be safe out there. <laughs> <laughs>